So big idea four is all about kinetics, chemical reactions and their rates. So this is the big idea of figuring out how fast reactions occur and quantifying using numbers how much of reactant A is being consumed. If you change reactant A, how does that change the rate of the reaction? If you change reactant B, how does that change the rate of the reaction? Etc. So the way we learned how to measure rates and discuss rates was by looking at rate laws. Okay? And the overall equation for a rate law is rate equals K times A to some exponent X times B to some exponent Y times Z to some exponent C to some exponent Z, where K is the rate constant. And remember, the units are not always the same. It depends on the rate law. Okay, The rate is the speed of the reaction. Okay. And each of these values, x, y, and z, are the order with respect to that compound. So x, let's say if it was a 1, we would say that a is first order, or this reaction is first order with respect to A. These values of X, Y, and Z have to be determined by experiment. Every reaction is going to be different. Every reaction is going to have a different mechanism. And the only way we can figure out these values, we cannot predict them, is by actually doing the experiment. So, for example, if we have a reaction, a set up example reaction here of A plus 2B plus C produces D, we do four different experiments, four different trials, one, two, three, four up here, where we vary the concentrations of each reactant and we measure the rate in molarity per second. Mol molarity per second. With this data, we can determine the rate law for this reaction. So remember, the rate law is going to have an overall equation of rate equals k times a to some power x, b to some power y, and c to some power z to some power z. In order to figure these out, remember that the goal is we have to find two trials where the concentrations of one reactant is changing but is staying constant for the others. So, for example, let's just try to figure out A first. We need to find two trials where A, the concentration of A is changing, but it's staying the same for B and C. Well, if we look at it carefully, that's going to be trial 3 and trial 4. A is getting going from 0.1 to 0.2 molar, but it's staying the same for B and C. How would we set this up? Well, there's two ways. The, we'll do the longer way first. So we would want to set up a ratio of rate of rate reaction 4 over rate of reaction 3. We just basically write the rate law for each one. So it's going to be K times the concentration of A, which is 0.2 to some power X, times point, excuse me, the concentration of B, uh, 0.2 to some power Y, times 0.1 to some power Z, and for the rate for our trial 3, it's going to be K rate constant times 0.1 to the X, 0.2 to the Y, and 0.1 to the Z. And this is going to be equal to the rate from trial 4, 0 0.08 over 0 0.02. So if we do some simplifications here, our K's cancel. 0.2 to the Y over 0.2 to the Y, 0.1 to the Z over 0.1 to the Z, those all cancel. So we're going to be left with 0.2 over 0.1, which is 2. So 2 to the X is equal to 0 0.08 divided by 0 0.02. That's going to be 4. So therefore, we know X is equal to 2. And therefore, three dots remaining, therefore, the reaction is second order with respect to A. So we could plug that 2 back into our equation up top here. Then we would need to do the same thing for B and for C to figure out the overall rate law. Remember, you can also just do it quickly. 
um, by just looking at the data in the table. So for example, let's uh, try to figure out what um, the order is with respect to B. So let's find the trials where B is changing, but A and C are constant. And it's a little tricky to see, but it's going to be trial 1 and trial 3. B is getting doubled. C is going to stay the same, 0.1, and A is staying the same as 0.1, and the rates are over here. So we can see that as the concentration of B is doubled times 2, the rate is also doubled, 0.01 to 0.02. So since whatever you do to B has the exact same effect on the rate, we know that, if you remember quickly, was first order. Um, essentially we would have something like 2 to the x equals 2 if we did it longhand, so x would equal 1. So we know this reaction is first order with respect to B. What I would recommend is you go ahead now and figure out what the order is with respect to C. So go ahead and figure that out now. Once you figured the order out with respect to C, the overall rate law would be rate equals K times the concentration of A to the power of 2 times the concentration of B to the power of 1 and you should have figured out that C is zero order so basically it would be C to the power of 0 so it doesn't actually show up in the rate law this would be the final answer for the rate law for this reaction now Problems would also then ask you to go back and calculate K. And the way you would do that, just to refresh your memory, is you would need to find these values, concentration of A, B, and the rate for any given trial. One, two, three, or four. It doesn't matter. Then you would just plug all those numbers in here. 0.08 would go here. Concentration of A, if we chose trial four, would go in here. And B would go in here. Then you do some algebra to solve for k, you check your units, and you'd have your rate constant. So manipulating those problems using data sets is an important skill. We also learned how to use this data with graphs. We learned about the integrated rate laws, which were equations that are derived uh, using a little bit of calculus, taking the rate laws and doing some integrals. Um, and we learned how to recognize the uh, order of a reaction based on the graph. So for the last reaction we had the rate law was rate equals k times a to the power of 2, b to the power of 1. So we would say that this reaction overall is third order. Remember to figure out the overall order of the reaction, we add up all of the exponents, the orders to each individual component. We also know, if we're not given the data sets, how to figure out the order of the reaction just given some graphs. So, for example, we learned that if a reaction was zero order overall, and we plotted against time, apologize this doesn't quite fit, the concentration of the reactant, we would see a line that it has a negative slope, where the slope is equal to the value of negative k. So if we saw a reaction and we plotted, if we, we collected some data and we plotted the concentration of A versus time and we got a straight line, that tells us it is zero order with respect to that, constant, that, that reactant, in this case A. On the other hand, if we made a graph of, the con of time and natural log of the concentration of A, and we got a straight line that looked like this. We know the slope of that line is equal to negative K, the rate constant. And if when we plotted the data of natural log versus time, and we got a straight line, it would tell us that it is first order with respect to that reactant. Last but not least, if we plotted the reciprocal, one over the concentration of A versus time, and we got a straight line, we would see a straight line with a positive slope. So the positive slope here would equal K. And this would represent a second order reaction with respect to A only. 
So this should ring a bell for when we did the uh, lab with the crystal violet, and we used the spectra photometer, which we'll talk about in a second. And we used our spreadsheets to make Excel graphs of these three. One, two, three. And then you just had to figure out which graph had the straightest line. That tells you the order with respect to that reactant. Okay. One other thing that's going to be on the equation sheet was half-life, which is an important concept to understand. Remember the half-life is the amount of time it takes for the amount of a reactant to be cut in half. So for half of a reactant to be consumed. And sometimes it's abbreviate T1 half, the amount of time. There's only one equation that you need to know that is on the equation sheet for the AP test. T1 half equals 0.693 over K. This is only true for first order reactions. So if you want to figure out the half-life for a reactant that is first order, you just need to do 0.693 divided by the rate constant K, and that will give you the amount of time needed to for half of that substance to be consumed. So all of this data has shown, okay, if we change the concentration, that's clearly going to change the rate. But there's other things that can change rate as well. For example, we learned that Anything that increases collisions will increase the rate of a reaction. Anything that increases the rate of collisions between molecules. So, for example, um, if you increase surface area, we make something from a solid to a powder. We break it up into pieces. If we have more surface area, rate is faster. If we increase concentration, we just saw the amount of molecules. That means more collisions. If we decrease volume, if we make a container smaller, molecules are forced to collide with each other more. We could add a catalyst, which basically works by lowering the activation energy of, a molecule, of molecules. So this should be review, but, you know, we lower the height of that hill. And we can also increase the temperature. Increasing the temperature gives molecules more kinetic energy, so they collide with each other more frequently. So we can actually graph that with something called the Boltzmann distribution. Okay, The Boltzmann distribution shows how many molecules have a particular amount of kinetic energy. So if we have a sample of a gas in this beaker here, there's molecules moving all around, but they're not all moving at the exact same speed. Some are moving very fast, some are moving a lot slower, but the majority of them will be moving at a particular speed. And the way we can see those graphs is, let's say that this gas is initially at 200 Kelvin. Okay, We would see something that kind of looks like this. Okay, Where this height right here, okay, the highest point basically indicates the temperature of the gas. If we heated this up to, let's say, 300 Kelvin, how would that affect the Boltzmann distribution? Well, since the molecules are hotter, they're going to have a higher uh, kinetic energy. They're going to have more kinetic energy and higher temperature. So essentially, this line needs to be shifted to the right. What you need to remember is that any time that line gets shifted to the right, the height of the hill decreases. So essentially, it kind of gets more spread out. So we would see something like this, where the new temperature down here 300 Kelvin is further to the right, indicating it's at a higher temperature. Let's say instead of heating it up, we cooled it down to 100 Kelvin. Well, now the molecules have less kinetic energy, so this line is going to shift to the left. So the height of this hill is going to go up, and then something down like so. So if we drop this down, T3, that would indicate the molecules moving at a lower speed compared to the other two. So those are Boltzmann distributions. The thing to the big concept to remember is increasing collisions between molecules increases the rate. One way we discussed um, collecting data for a kinetics experiment is using a spectrophotometer. A spectrophotometer. Okay. 
and you should remember us using this in class collecting data with crystal violet CV and we use sodium hydroxide to re um, measure how fast the reaction was occurring it went from a purple to a colorless solution when we use that we used an equation called Beer's Law because if you remember the setup we basically the spectrophotometer worked by having a sample in a cuvette with our solution okay and then we shined a ray of light through it at a particular wavelength and on the other side there was this detector which measured the absorbance okay and the idea if it was absorbing more light that means more light is getting through if the absorbance was lower that means less light is getting through but the spectrophotometer doesn't measure concentration directly so we have to use an equation called Beer's Law A equals A, B, C in order to relate concentration and absorbance together so let's go over these variables again this A is for the absorbance it has no units okay that's what the computer told us A is called the molar absorption activity and that's a constant depending on what the compound is B was the path length remember the width of the cuvette which was about one centimeter for our experiments and then C of course is what we're left with concentration so basically there's a linear relationship here. If we know the path length and molar absorptivity, we can convert the absorbance to concentration. So we need to know how to do problems with that. Um, and what this allows us to do is it allows us to figure out how to calculate rates. To measure, we can, we can generate graphs where we change concentration and we measure the rate and we can make those tables like we saw earlier and we can figure out the rate law. But more importantly, we can also figure out the mechanism, the steps by which a reaction happens. So, for example, let's consider this reaction here. Uh, two molecules of A plus two molecules of B need to react in order to produce one molecule of C and one molecule of D. So we know that reactions don't occur just in one step always. Okay, It's going to be very hard for two molecules of A and two molecules of B to collide with each other in the exact right place, in the exact right time, with the exact enough amount of energy in order to produce C and D. Rather, most reactions occur by a series of steps, and the sequence of steps is called the mechanism, the process by which it happens. So here's a proposed mechanism for this reaction. This proposed mechanism has three steps. One, two, three. The overall rate law for this reaction has been determined as K equals A to the power of 2, B to the power of 1. Same as before. All right? We also know that the middle step is the slowest step based on our experiment. So what's, how do we check to figure out if this is a possible mechanism? Well, number one, the steps add up to overall reaction. So they got to add up to the overall reaction. So let's see if that's true. Basically, let's just add up all what's on the reactants and the product side. But first, let's see if there's anything we can cancel. So X is a product in step one. It's a reactant in step two. So we can get rid of that. And same thing with Y. Boom, boom. So we would say X and Y are intermediates. They show up in the mechanism, but they don't show up in the overall final reaction. So what does that leave us with? Uh, A and A makes uh, 2A. What else do we have? Boom, B and B. 2B, and then we have a C and a D, C plus D, yep, so check, that equals what we started with. The second thing that must be true is that the rate law of the rate determining step must equal the overall rate law. And one thing to clarify, it's the rate law of the rate determining step and what is before it.
of everything before that step, okay? So, for example, the rate law here is k equals a to the power of 2, b to the power of 1. How do we figure out what the rate determining step is? The rate determining step is the slowest step. So in that case, this is step 2, which we've determined by experiment. This would be told to you. So what would the rate law for step 2 be? Well, the only reactants are x and b, but x is an intermediate, so it doesn't matter. So b is a reactant, and there is a coefficient of 1 in front of b. So, boom. That's the rate law for step 2. But since the rate determining step is a second step, in order to figure out the rate law, we also have to figure out what is before it, which is step 1. So what are the molecules in step 1? We have two molecules of A as reactants. So that means this is going to be A to the power of 2, because we have two molecules of A. So based on the mechanism here, the rate law for the rate determining step and the step before it is this. Is that the same as the overall rate law? Boom, boom, yep. So this mechanism could be valid for this reaction. We'll get a lot of practice with analyzing rate laws, graphs, doing mechanisms and whatnot in class, but these are the key notes from Big Idea for chemical reactions and their rates.